Not just his color made the pale wild stallion unique. His bold, fearless personality set him apart. I have tracked him through the seasons of his life, a journey that began on the day of his birth when I named him Cloud. Funny and precocious, he grew up in a wilderness full of danger and excitement. Cloud became a band stallion in spite of drought, fire, and stealthy predators. One surprise after another awaited me as Cloud became a father and fought to hold on to his family in his Montana mountain stronghold. Hi, welcome to my home in the Colorado Rockies. We're about 600 miles south of the Arrowhead Mountains of Montana. That's where Cloud and the wild horses of the Arrowheads live. It's been a daunting task to document the life of a real wild animal who lives so far away from my home. But that's just what I've been doing since May 29th of 1995. That's when I saw a little glimmer of white coming through the trees. When I turned, the Palomino mare was leading her little tottering colt out of the trees, and he was white. At least he looked completely white to me. It took me hours to realize that he really wasn't white because in time I could see that he had a narrow white blaze and two front white stockings. And that was my introduction to a colt that over the weeks started to show this really outgoing personality. I knew that someday, I was sure of it, Cloud was going to become a band stallion. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself because my real adventure with the wild horses happened about a year and a half before that. I got a call from Marty Stauffer. He's the producer of the popular Wild America television show that ran for many years on PBS. And Marty said, I've always wanted to do a film about Mustangs. Would you shoot it for me? And I, I jumped at the, the chance. He said, well, you know a lot about horses. And so that's why I wanted you to do it. And I hadn't even put the receiver back in the cradle before I started to worry because I had had horses all my life. I'd ridden since I was a little kid. And I thought, how can I make a whole half hour TV show about animals that just stand around in a pasture and graze all day? What I didn't know was anything about wild horses. I was completely ignorant about them. But I, I set out to try to find out what I could. I went on a location scouting trip with my sister. We went all the way to Oregon, where the Kiger horses live. We went to Nevada. We went to the western slope of Colorado. And we went to the Wyoming-Montana border. And that's where I saw a raven. It was early morning in the Red Desert, and here came a black stallion. And he had a little newborn colt that I named Diamond because he had a great huge star in his head. And Raven came over and he snorted and he ran away. Not just Raven, but all the wild horses that we'd seen in the West ran away at the sight of humans. And I thought, this is gonna be tough. But I knew there was some kind of a connection with that horse. And so I started documenting Raven's family. I'd filmed wild animals all around the world, and one of the methods that was so effective was to use a blind or a hide so that the animals couldn't see you and you could film them doing their natural thing. And that's what I decided to do on the arrowheads. 
I knew that water holes would be a good place to film wild horses. They had to come to drink, right? And so I went in the rocks above a water hole and got my camera and tripod all situated down in rocks. I was well concealed and I waited. The first band that came was a dun stallion with his mares and they all came to the water and the mares were drinking and the stallion looked right up where I was and he gave the most explosive snort and he ran away, the mares ran away and every horse on those subalpine meadows, meadows tore away. I, uh, I stood up from my hide and said to myself, well, that worked well. I knew that my strategy of filming such sensitive prey animals like wild horses was going to have to change. And so what I did is I decided to make myself conspicuously benign. I would plant myself out in the middle of the meadows, these subalpine meadows where the horses came in the summertime, and I would sit. And when they came near, I would wave, like, here's this stupid two-legged uh, sitting among you, hoping that I would become as, as, as inconspicuous as a rock or a bush, that I, I wouldn't be perceived as a predator, but at the very least, some object or another prey species. And that worked for me. I'd been filming an entire year before Cloud was born. And it was particularly Raven that seemed accepting of me being around. He, he seemed to ignore me, he and his three mares. And so by the time Cloud was born, the band more or less had accepted me as this object in their environment that came around every once in a while. Their society is, is, is governed by strict behavior. The, the foals uh, learn how to behave with the adults and the parents, and there's a hierarchy within the band. Uh, there's the dominant male, the band stallion. There's frequently a lead mare who plays a very important role because she will lead the horses to water, to uh, safety if there's perceived danger with the stallion pulling up the rear, protecting the rear, unless the danger is perceived in front and then the stallion will go in front. So the stallion plays a key role as father and protector. Then there's a hierarchy also within the different bands that you see. There's, there's an interesting interaction that takes place. Raven, because he was a dominant stallion, and still is a dominant stallion, had a large band, and he very, has a very powerful personality. That personality he passes on to his own offspring, by the way, including Cloud. When they came to the water hole, for instance, Raven's band would be allowed to go to drink while the other bands would stand and watch, those that were smaller or those that were less dominant. When Cloud was a baby with his family, they were really pretty easy to find. But when Cloud became a two-year-old bachelor, the challenges became even greater. Bachelors are so fun. Uh, they, they play, they fight, they run around, they get into trouble. Uh, they're kind of like a gang of rowdy teenage boys, but they're also hard to find. Because they have no responsibilities, they can go wherever they want, whenever they want. And in fact, we were unsuccessful in any winter of Cloud's bachelor life in finding him. There was only about a five month period of his life that I really could find him. And then in the fall when the snows came, he disappeared and I worried and fretted, but each spring he'd show up again on the mountaintop. By the time he was four, which is long before most bachelors try to, to build a family because they're just too young and small and immature, Cloud decided that he was gonna steal Mateo's band. Now, Mateo is this burly, husky, small, but very stocky bay stallion and was only, I think, eight or nine years old, so really in the prime of his life. In order to get these long running fighting sequences that you see in the first cloud film, I would use a very long lens and I would try to position myself somewhere where I could see a lot of territory. And from those vantage points, I could just let that action unfold in front of my camera.
McLeod as a four-year-old really just didn't have a chance to steal those mares from Mateo. And over, over that winter, um, he went into winter very thin, and I was, I was more worried about him than I had been uh, since he was a newborn foal. I really didn't know whether he would come out of, of winter, and I had no idea where he went in winter either. But in the spring, what a surprise. I saw a five-year-old fighting stallion, and he came out with a flurry. And that's the year in which he fought and injured Plenty Coup. The first film ends with Cloud being successful getting an older Gria mare and her red dun son. I thought the first five years of Cloud's life were really exciting, and the next two years, which are the years we cover in the next film, Cloud's Leg Legacy, were really exciting as well. One of the things that I started to see happen were foals disappearing. And when, when Cloud was little and, and a baby, pretty much the foals that you would see on the mountain when you came up there were the ones you saw the next time you came up to the mountain. There might be a few deaths, but very, very few, very little predation. But when Cloud's legacy was born, that year there were probably 30% of the foals were killed by mountain lions. I remember one time uh, I was in Penn's cabin and I had looked out of the door and I could see a plenty coup with his new mares and uh, he had a real bright red sorrel foal with a big blaze. And that was about 10 o'clock at night. The next morning I got up about 6, I walked out of Penn's cabin, walked down in the direction where I had seen Plenty Coup the night before. Plenty Coup was there, his mares were there, the sorrel foal was missing. I walked the cliff edges and searched for anything that would give me a sign, but it was as if an alien spacecraft had come and, and taken the foal away. So it, it is a dangerous place, but what a grand place to live and to live free. And that's the, the most wonderful part of Cloud's life, I think. Because of his unusual color, he has been allowed to live free. And I'm sure that he will die free. He will die on the mountain where he was born. He was rounded up in 1997 as a two-year-old. And because of his unusual color, he was allowed to go free. Another colt that I'd really admired in the wild was a, a yearling, a blue roan, and he was not allowed to go free. He was auctioned off by the BLM, and luckily enough I was able to buy Trace, and um, although I always will wish that he had been allowed to live free, he has become a great friend of mine. Don't be afraid. Training a wild animal is an interesting uh, experience. I had trained my two-year-old quarter horse that I had when I was in high school. And uh, that was a totally different experience from having a wild animal because wild horses are as wild as the deer and elk. And what's really important is to establish a bond of trust. That may take time. And I'd love to think that everybody who adopts a wild horse will take the time it takes take the time it takes to establish a friendship before you force this horse into doing things that he's too frightened to do. Trace has always been fearful of people on horseback, things that are up high. He's also been fearful of sticks and plastic bags. And it's pretty easy to explain why he has that fear. He was rounded up by a helicopter that came at him from above. He was driven into corrals where a mounted person with a stick and a plastic bag drove he and his family through the alleyways and into their corral. And then he was worked through chutes with what? People atop corral gates with sticks and plastic bags. Well, we went to the Pirelli workshop in Pagosa Springs. And um, through the course of the workshop, we did the ground stuff, and Trace was great at that. But then we mounted up with 43 other people in the same corral. 43 mounted riders, just the thing that Trace is afraid of, people on horseback. And of those 43 was not only the, all the Pirelli trainers, but Pat Pirelli himself. And he called my name to come out and work with him. He was mounted, he had a stick with a plastic bag on the end of it. And 
Although Trace and I lived through the experience, it was not a pretty sight. Actually, Trace did pretty well, even though I didn't know my right hand from my left. But that experience really gave us confidence in each other that we could live through something like that. His worst, worst fears, uh, and he lived through it. And it really helped us when we uh, went up on the Arrowhead Mountains to do the opening sequence for Cloud's Legacy. Over the next two years, I continued to follow Cloud and the wild horses of the Arrowheads. He and I were to walk. I was to talk, he was to walk along with me, and, and he did a beautiful job. He hit all his marks and so did I, and I think my New York clients were really pleased. The wild horses of the Arrowheads have about 40,000 acres of wilderness that they roam, and that doesn't even count the thousands and thousands of acres outside the range that they also use as usually their, their late summer graze. And so uh, finding them uh, is hard, location scout or not. Um, and we have successfully used Trace, and I have been able to find Cloud by riding Trace. And in Cloud's Legacy, you'll see me riding him in the winter down in the Red Desert. We had not been able to find Cloud for months. We had no idea if he, were, if he was up on Sykes Ridge, if he was down in the desert, we just didn't know. And so I rode Trace, and I found Cloud. Well, that's not really true. Cloud found me. And as I think about it and think back over the years, it wasn't ever us finding them. It wasn't me finding Cloud. It, it was Raven first, Raven and his family finding me. It was Cloud finding us, much more so than us finding them. I think that for some reason, my path was set and all I had to do was put one foot in front of, of another and walk that path, and these kind of really wonderful things would happen. Okay, should we go look for the horses? I feel like that's what I spend my life doing, looking for horses. We have a little better chance here, though. Let's go find Trace. You find Trace? Hey, big guy. I don't see horses. Warm as it is, um, they could be in the trees, so we'll go look there. Come here. I see them. Look out underneath that tree out there. You see them? They're all together. Three geldings and two mares. These are Cloud's birth sisters, the ones that you see in the first Cloud film. These are the ones that Cloud loved to uh, tease. Yes, aren't you a good girl? This is Cloud's sister, Smokey. You want to go for a little ride? Hmm? Yeah. No water hole, huh? I think that's always a disappointment. He's always, um, he's always loved the water. In the first film, he nearly um, he nearly dumped me in the water hole. It's been years since Trace has had a good role in a water hole. He, he doesn't seem to remember or care that he has a passenger this time. <laughs> he, I could feel his um, legs buckling, and uh, that's when I had to really get a hold of him and get him out of there because I knew we were going down. <laughs> I don't know whether you can get uh, get a shot of of Trace's feet, but these are natural feet. You know, when we we've bred horses over the years, a lot of times we we ignored the strength of the foot. And with a wild horse, if you don't have a good solid foot and uh, you can't hold up, you're you're not going to make it in the wild. So this is really a great foot. They walk on the entire frog and sole, so it's very flat, very strong. A lot of the uh, horses from the arrowheads have been uh, blood tested. They draw blood or hair samples when they're in the corrals during a roundup. So they have a pretty good idea, genetically, what these horses are about. They have something 
in the genetic makeup called the QAC variant. And um, that is a very Spanish marker. And uh, it uh, traces them back to the Caribbean and the breeding farms of the conquistadors. The conquistadors used the, the Caribbean to raise their horses for the South American and Mexican invasions. And uh, the closest living relative to the uh, arrowhead horses are the Puerto Rican Pasifinos. Uh, traces genetics. He's either got um, some descendants that were uh, southern Wyoming, Red Desert, or the uh, Kiger area of eastern Oregon and western Idaho. And that met, uh, sent me to wondering if maybe Trace is related to the Lewis and Clark expedition horses, because in uh, 1806, on their return journey from the west, uh, Lewis and Clark had traded for horses with the Nez Perce and the Shoshone. And uh, in the Arrowhead Mountains, those horses were stolen by the Indians. So he may be a descendant of the Lewis and Clark horses. It's kind of a neat thing to think about, at least. Even though there was a, a law passed to protect them, we have to be very diligent or we're going to lose these wild horses. You know, there's only a few thousand left in the wild. And it's not just that there are only a few thousand left. The herds are so small that they are in jeopardy of losing their genetic viability, which means that they can become inbred if they aren't in large enough herds. Even Trace's herd um, only has around 150, 160 wild horses right now, just the bare minimum to achieve genetic viability. So we need to be really diligent or we could lose these wonderful animals forever.